Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to conservation and careful management of the state's forests to make them more resilient and better habitats for wildlife. Choosewood.com. This is St. Louis on the Air from St. Louis Public Radio. I'm Elaine Cha. It's never the big picture, but it's always the tiny, tiny details that give you a story. We invented it, and it sounds really convincing. It sounds like it's a thing. But on the other hand, you know, people who sh- sell shoes don't have shoe sellers block. <laughs> um, <laughs> chefs don't have chefs block. What, what writers, I think, have is actually getting stuck. Can you tell when it's in the works, if it's going to be particularly amazing? Why is Neil Gaiman famous? <laughs> he would write the stories in shop windows, in bookshop windows, and they'd mm. set him up with his typewriter. Oh. And I asked him about that, and I said, why did you do that? And he said, I wanted to demystify the process. There are a lot of credits and accolades to English writer Neil Gaiman's name, a recipient of both the Newbery and Carnegie Medals. Tonight, April 13th, Gaiman will take the stage at the Sheldon Concert Hall to receive another award, the 2023 St. Louis Literary Award. Presented annually by the St. Louis University Libraries, the award recognizes a writer who, quote, deepens our insight into the human condition and expands the scope of our compassion. It's been given to writers from here and abroad since 1967. Past recipients include August Wilson, Salman Rushdie, Stephen Sondheim, and Margaret Atwood. Gaiman's writing encompasses a truly stunning range. Comics, novels, children's books, screen adaptations. His body of work includes titles like Coraline, Neverwhere, The Ocean at the End of the Lane, American Gods, The Graveyard Book, Stardust, and The Sandman. We're lucky enough to have Neil Gaiman here in studio to talk with us about his work and his creative process before he accepts the 2023 St. Louis Literary Award tonight. Neil, welcome to St. Louis on the Air. What a treat to have you here. What an (laughs) honor to be here. Thank you. Now, the intro listed just some of your work and the accolades you've received in your career. But I'd like to start with a question that my seven-year-old asked after we reread Pirate Stew together last night. Why is Neil Gaiman famous? <laughs> <laughs> um, I Even Neil Gaiman isn't actually quite sure because being a famous writer is such a peculiar thing anyway. Most, most writers are uh, only name famous Mm -hmm. and I used to be name famous and I was very comfortable being name famous and then somewhere in the last five years I became face famous as well Um, and now it's just a bit weird. So (laughs) that weirdness, um, did it find you? I think what I did was um, work in lots of different fields, which normally is a recipe for for disaster and failure Mm -hmm. because if you're going to be famous and successful as a writer, you should do the same thing over and over again and then people know where to find you and they know what you do. And I've been doing lots of different things over the years in lots of different puddles. Mm -hmm. But I think what's happened is the puddles have all filled up and overflowed and become an enormous pond. Okay. (laughs) Um, So over here was the children's fiction and over here was the graphic novels and the comics work and over here I was writing adult uh, fiction and then there was the nonfiction and the essays and the work on supporting libraries and then, uh, you know, in another corner I've been doing stage, screen and television adaptations and (laughs) <laughs> they all just sort of met Come in the together. Middle. Well, that gets to something that I was thinking, because if someone were to Google your name, the thing that comes up is writer. Um, 
Do you see yourself still primarily as a writer, or has the experience of the last five years sort of um, helped you expand uh, and, and sort of think or approach things differently? I think I'm fundamentally a writer. I think I'm fundamentally a storyteller. What I will always be at default <laughs> is somebody who makes things up and writes them down because I can write them down better than I could tell them in conversation. <laughs> um, but what I'm not is, for example, a novelist. Uh, I, have, I have friends who are novelists, and what they do is they build novels, mm -hmm. and they know that they're working if they're writing a novel. And I have friends who are poets. I have friends who are short story writers. I have friends who are screenwriters, and they write fabulous television and film scripts. I'm none of these things. I'm kind of an amphibian. Uh -huh. I, I move very happily between media. As long as I'm telling a story, I'm happy. That's really the baseline then. Is storytelling something that you wanted to do from the time you were young? Because I, I asked this question about Pirate Stew, and then the Graveyard Book is, is obviously um, a, a work that is, I guess, ostensibly just for kids. Is it something that you always wanted from the time you were a child? Absolutely. Um, I mean, I remember, you know, taking my mum aside at the age of two or three and dictating poems and little stories to her because I couldn't write them down yet. Um, and I also remember as a kid reading stories and some of them and some authors I would love. And sometimes I'd read a story and I'd go, you've forgotten. You don't know what it's like to be a kid. You don't know who you're writing for. And I would promise myself that I wouldn't forget. Mm -hmm. I'd promise myself I would remember. And I would try and write books for kids when I was old enough to write books for kids that were that hadn't forgotten. So that for me is why I think the Graveyard work, Book works so well for kids and for adults, mm -hmm. is it's being written on both levels. And so the work that you've done is, it's so well loved, it's well known. Um, as I was preparing for this interview, I thought you need, Neil Gaiman has done so many interviews, scores of interviews over the course of your career. Um, so I'm guessing that this is your first one in St. Louis? Uh, second one. The second one. Well, as the second one here in our studio, and because this is St. Louis on the air, our team figured that asking our listeners, many of whom are serious fans of yours, to send us their questions um, so that this could be an experience that is special for them, but also is, is special for you. Great. Here's one that we got about the Midwest, and this is from Kim in St. Charles, who left us a voicemail. Her question is tied to your book, American Gods. I was wondering, with references to Cairo, Illinois, and other odd roadside attractions in the Midwest, have you had any opportunities to explore St. Louis or any uh, Missouri oddities while you're in town? Uh, not yet, although there are things that have been on my list of of places I want to visit, uh, like your museum. The weird, What's the weird one? Oh, city, the, the city, city museum. museum. The city yes. museum. Yes, delightfully weird. <laughs> I, that's, that's one of those places I, the first time I read about it, I went, oh, this is one of my places. Right, right. I have right. to go here. Um, and then in conversation with John Hamm once, who is um, one of my favorite people, on the set of Good Omens, we started mm -hmm. talking and he started explaining to me why I needed to go to the City Museum. Okay. So. Well, it's great that you're, you're here. Hopefully you'll get that opportunity. And you should definitely wear sneakers and uh, comfortable pants when you go. <laughs> As a follow-up, how have your travels, um, because of your work all around the world, informed what you write about and, and how you do so? You know, I love, one of the things I love about traveling is it's never the big picture, but it's always the tiny, tiny details that give you a story. Um, I spent ages in China researching a project that I still haven't actually done yet. Mm. Um, but most of the stuff about China that I saw, I could have written just from knowledge of China, from films, from books. 
And then I was halfway up a mountain and somebody on the side of the mountain had set up a little stand and they were selling snow white honey from their own hives mm -hmm. halfway up this mountain. And I not only bought a jar, but I got a fabulous short story out of it. And uh -huh. it was just that moment where you see something and that you're not expecting it, but you know that somehow you found a story. Mm -hmm. Now, does this mean that you are a writer always and everywhere? So when you experience that g going up um, that, that hill, the mountain in China, did you have a, a pen or a pencil on your person or do you just remember things and then translate them to the page or, or the screen sometime after? That's a great question. And uh, there are two answers, both of which are true. Uh, one of which is I'm, I'm oh, obsessive yes. about having pens uh, on me always yeah. and little notebooks and things because you never know when you're going to get caught with a fabulous idea and you just need to scribble. Um, but the other bit is that you often only find the you realize what was important afterwards. Mm -hmm. And normally things happen in your life. They can be tiny, odd things like the Snow White Honey. Mm -hmm. And then they're like a little little bit of grit inside an oyster and they accrete nacreous layers and yeah. suddenly you have a pearl of a story. And it's an entire world that you end up building then. Now, there's a quote attributed to you that sets up this next question, I think, pretty nicely. And you can confirm whether this actually came from you. Being a writer is a very peculiar sort of job. It always, it's always you versus a blank sheet of paper or a blank screen. screen. <laughs> and quite often, the blank piece of paper wins. I did say that, yes. No. And it's still true. Does writing ever get any easier? No, and it's incredibly <laughs> unfair. I've been, I've been, you know, alive now for sixty-two years. I've been making my li living writing for forty of those years. And uh, when you start out, you're not quite good enough. But every idea, every sentence, everything you're doing, you're doing for the first time. Mm -hmm. So you're desperately trying to get better, but at least it's all new and original. And then suddenly you're my age and you're going, I know exactly how to do this brilliantly. But, you know, I can't really do that because I wrote that 20 years ago. So that idea and that sentence, I need to dump them and I just need to do this a slightly different way. Mm -hmm. So, no, nope, never gets any easier. So that relationship with writing, um, one of the first emails that we got came from Dennis, and Dennis is actually someone we work with. And here's what he sent. He said, I read American Gods several years ago. It was a bit off my traditional reading path of commercially popular geopolitical intrigue novels and more obscure Scandinavian Icelandic crime mysteries. But I heard about it on NPR and was intrigued. Last year, when I finally succumbed to my wife's insistence to rid the house of at least most of the hundreds of books I have read over the last several years, I held back a few, a very few, included among those in this pile of a dozen or fewer cherished treasures, kind of making a picture in the mind, alongside an old family Bible and a tattered copy of On the Road is a pre-owned copy of American Gods. Uh, Mr. Gaiman has that quote-unquote something. He has insight, vision, imagination that genuinely excites me. In my own little mind, he himself is a true American God, not the God Almighty, perhaps, but maybe, just maybe, one of those other underestimated gods. Now, another thing that Dennis had included in that email, and we kind of um, edited a little bit, was that after reading your work, he gave up on trying to write because he felt like he could not achieve or attain um, the kind of quality that is in your writing. What would you say to someone? <laughs> oh, I, I'd be, I would be sad. I would tell him, no, 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 you've got to write. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to write, just keep going. Um, 
you know, for me, I'm never happier than when I run into a young writer, a just published writer, um, somebody who tells me that some book of mine set them off on the path to becoming a writer. And often I'm happiest when they say, you made it look like fun. Mm -hmm. um, I look back on the writers who inspired me, people like Roger Zelazny or Harlan Ellison or Ursula K. Le Guin. Um, and a lot of them, one of the things that I would look at is it really looked like they were having fun writing. It looked like they were enjoying themselves. And I wanted to have part of that fun. Mm -hmm. So the joy, it, it transports and it transfers. <laughs> I hope so. And I also hope that it inspires a little. So right. I, would be, I would be so sad if somebody said, oh, no, I, I read your thing and I didn't write because you'd said it all and you'd done it all. That would be like, no. And, <laughs> and you think about the fact that we human beings as a species have been around for half a million years, something like that. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure we've told an awful lot of stories to each other in that time, but it's okay. We can tell them again. Sure. Um, we, we can, they're ours and we're telling them in our time. And my stories will never be your stories and your stories will never be somebody else's stories. So we get to tell our own stories. And telling us some of his story in our studio today is Neil Gaiman, or Gaiman. Yeah. Yes, Neil Gaiman, prolific and celebrated writer and recipient of the 2023 St. Louis Literary Award. We also had a, a comment come in from Lilith from South St. Louis, who wrote, I was fortunate enough to take Neil's master class, and it was wonderful. I'm wondering how much control he had over developing the curriculum, and how he went about designing such an informative class. What a lovely thing. Um, when the, the people who do Masterclass basically came to me and they said, we've, we've basically read everything that we can ever find that you've written about writing and we've seen every interview and we have lots and lots of questions. So half of it was from their questions, and half of it was from the fact I, I teach um, at a college near me in New York State called mm. Bard College, and I've been teaching twice a year, just, uh, you know, 15, 16 students, and we do a course on adapting Shakespeare, we do a course on writing and reading the fantastic, whatever, and it was fun just being able to take all of what I'd learned from them and what I'd learned from teaching them and go, okay, I want that in here too. Mm -hmm. I want to be able to talk about why we write, how we write. If you're a writer, how do you deal with writer's block? Um, if you're a writer, how do you make characters different and interesting? How do you write a short story? What is a novel for? What is fiction for? Mm -hmm. And just talk about all of those things in the hope that I could send some of the people who watched the masterclass out into the world as writers themselves. Mm -hmm. And also, I wanted to demystify it. I mentioned Harlan Ellison earlier, um, a writer who is now dead, who was my friend. And one of the things that Harlan did when I was just a kid was he would write stories in shop windows, in bookshop windows, and they'd mm. set him up with his typewriter. Oh. And I asked him about that, and I said, why did you do that? And he said, I wanted to demystify the process. I wanted to show people that writing at root is a blue collar occupation. You are sitting there and you are typing and somebody is doing this. And I loved that idea of just demystifying it enough to tell people, no, you can do it. Yeah, that's lovely. <laughs> and speaking of writer's block, what has writer's block been like for you? For instance, is this something that takes up residence before you realize it's there, or do you know and feel it immediately? For me, um, I think writer's block, I think writers are really clever. We, we are incredibly imaginative, and I think we invented writer's block. Mm. I think we, in, 
we invented it and it sounds really convincing. It sounds like it's a thing. But on the other hand, you know, people who sh sell shoes don't have shoe sellers block. <laughs> sure. um, chefs don't have chef's block. What, what writers, I think, have is actually getting stuck. Mm. And the moment that you say getting stuck rather than writer's block, you're demystifying it a little mm. bit. But you're also removing it from the gods because writer's block is obviously something that the gods decide that you have to suffer from and endure <laughs> and one day they may lift it. Whereas if you're stuck on your book, um, that's something fixable. Mm -hmm. And you can ask yourself, okay, why am I stuck? Am I stuck because I went off the rails somewhere on this thing I was writing as the plot did I take a wrong turn? In which case I should backtrack. Am I, have I simply run out of ideas? Okay, then I need to stop and look at what I'm doing and look at what the ideas are. So I think for me, the key is just rephrasing it. Okay. If you start with the idea of, okay, I'm stuck, then you can figure out how to retrace your steps and how to get unstuck. Get going again. Now, you had mentioned earlier over the last five years these puddles, have mm -hmm. many puddles, turned into a pond. Um, and one of the ways that many people are now finding their way to your written work is through what you've done with adaptations, which is another form of writing. Um, but we'd like to hear a little more from you about that. Courtney from South St. Louis left us a voicemail asking about your work being turned into film. I would love to hear more about the experience of turning your work into screen productions because a lot of your work has been translated to film and other kinds of programs. Um, and some adaptations seem to work better than others, like Coraline was wonderful. Um, and Sandman was probably one of the most anticipated. We all had the highest expectations for that. There are a lot of critics on deck to pick it apart. Real easy to disappoint fans, but it's brilliant. Um, so I wondered if you could talk about the magic that goes into that, that makes a difference in the success of an adaptation, and, and wonder, can you tell when it's in the works, if it's going to be particularly amazing, like what makes you really excited about how it's going, and what makes you uneasy? One thing that I have now that I didn't have when we started out was control. Um, so when I started out and adaptations were happening, um, or even if I was working directly for the screen, I only had as much power as the writer has in that I could write a script or I'd written the original work that was being adapted, but I was um, often at the bottom of the pole or, or, or not even considered as somebody who had any importance. You know, there was, Sandman was in movie development for about 30 years. Um, and they wanted to make big movies. And the one thing they were all agreed on was that obviously the guy who wrote the comics should have nothing to do with that. And then they'd write terrible scripts <laughs> sure. and they wouldn't get made. And <laughs> when we went out with Sandman as a TV series mm -hmm. in 2019, and we went out to, to Netflix and various other people. Um, Warner Brothers went out going, what we have here is something very special because we have Sandman and we have Neil. Uh -huh. Right. Um, so I, I think, you know, and that was because I'd made Good Omens particularly. Mm -hmm. um, so I think having, the, having some control, having some oversight really helps. Um, and I think, having said that, I think I've also been incredibly lucky. I think Coraline, what I did on that was pick Henry Selleck mm -hmm. and send Henry Selleck the book before it was published and say, I think you should make this. And Henry read it and agreed. And then I stuck with Henry for almost 10 years in the time it took him to get that film off the ground and get it made. Um, I'm very fond of the film of Stardust. I think Stardust is a 
You know, it's a film that people now are starting to rediscover and to discover and go, oh, we love this. It's, it's kind of like The Princess Bride. It's one of those <laughs> things. And that makes me really happy. Um, but it is, it's definitely less stressful for me getting to make things um, like Good Omens, like Sandman, where I have a say and people listen and... And the fact that I know more about this thing that they are making than anything else actually becomes useful because I can give them my knowledge. Right. Little little inside bits of information. Absolutely. That make it into details that we remember. You mentioned Stardust, and Stardust is one of the books in addition to um, the Graveyard book that you will be focusing on in your 2023 campus read on St. Louis University's campus, right? Why is it that you chose those books to talk, um, to talk about with, with university students? Well, I, first of all, I have to confess that I didn't choose them, and I was enormously pleased that they didn't make me choose. Oh, okay. Because <laughs> when you've got... Um, when you've done as much when as you've you done have. so many things, it's like okay, it, you know, pick your favorite children, and I that's exactly have what I was thinking. No idea right. what to pick, so I was thrilled that the people administrating the award um, they got to do the picking, mm-hmm. and I got to go. Oh, what lovely choices! And it makes me very happy. You know, the graveyard book, I suppose is an obvious choice because it won the Carnegie Medal, it won the Newbery Medal, it won a slew of other awards, and it's sort of gone on to be regarded as a classic. Mm -hmm. But Stardust, for me, is one of those books that despite the fact it's become a beloved film, despite the fact it's been a bestseller for decades now, it still takes people by surprise. It's the kind of thing they think they've read, but they haven't. Mm -hmm. And it is a fairy story for adults. Uh It was intended to... I I, I just started feeling very strongly that it wasn't fair that people didn't write fairy stories intended for adults. Mm -hmm. And I thought I would. And uh, so it's, it's a confection. And I think it has stuff going on underneath But at the end of the day, part of what Stardust is intended to do is just make its reader very happy. Well, I think you will be making many people very happy tonight when you go to the Sheldon for um, the acceptance of the award as well as what you're doing with the the students. Neil Gaiman, celebrated multi-genre writer and gracious conversationalist, thank you for including us among your St. Louis stops. Oh, that was so much fun. Thank you. This episode was produced by Alex Hoyer. Audio engineering and podcast design by Aaron Dorr. Our production intern is Avery Rogers. Our executive producer is Alex Hoyer. St. Louis on the Air is a production of St. Louis Public Radio. Understanding starts here. Our podcast proudly supports St. Louis artists by using music from Life Creative Group. Do you find yourself regularly listening to episodes of St. Louis on the Air? Suggest us to a friend you think might enjoy our conversations. And leave us a review and rating on Apple Podcasts on the App Store. It's the simplest way to help people discover our show. Thanks. St. Louis Public Radio is a member-supported service of the University of Missouri-St. Louis. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, providing more than 41,000 jobs in the production of wood pallets, railroad ties, white oak barrels, hardwood floors, and more. Details at choosewood.com.